Hello and welcome to another episode of the Omnibus Podcast, Minnesota's best weekly breakdown of political news inside and outside the Capitol. I'm your host, Jeremy Munson, a political activist, former state representative from Southern Minnesota, and the chairman of the Republican Liberty Caucus. And as usual, we're joined by State Representative Walter Hudson, a state representative from District 30A based in Albertville. Walter, uh, it's been, it was a crazy week for you on the House floor last week with the gun bills that came through. Um, also in the last couple of weeks, we've had congressional district conventions across the state and all eight of them. And uh, a couple of I wanted to dive into uh, from CD7, uh, which is the western half of Minnesota, and also in CD2, which is the southeast metro, um, there were some uh, more or less upsets that occurred. Uh, in CD7, uh, Steve Boyd was challenging Michelle Fishbach for the endorsement. And uh, of course, that's where the Ottertail County thing came into play, where Fishbach's team was trying to block the new delegates from being seated in Ottertail County and uh, preventing them from having a convention in the county. Uh, There was a a person from CD1 from Rochester, the chair of Olmstead County, that drove up there to have a convention, uh, host a convention with Jeff Backer um, for the delegates that were elected at caucus, uh, which the state party said, if you're going to have a convention for the county, you have to use the 2024 delegates that were elected at caucus. They held the convention, and those delegates that were elected to CD7 came to the convention and the grassroots, I watched people wearing fish box stickers voting to seat the 2024 elected congressional district delegates out of Ottertail County. And they had enough people to seat the delegates, which would have made a huge difference in, in Steve Boyd's campaign. And uh, the state party came out on stage and said, if they seat the 2024 delegates, the state party is going to invalidate the entire convention. Meanwhile, the convention had seated the 2022 elected delegates from Ottertail County, which goes against the rules of the whole convention since it specifically says you have to elect or you can only see the people from 2022. It was a mess. And, uh, you know, I think Steve Boyd's campaign made several attempts to, you know, try to figure out how they can get the right delegates seated. But in the end, they, they lost the multiple votes and motions and things because there was a threat that the state party was just going to invalidate the entire convention uh, before Steve could could get the endorsement. So he let the 2022 delegates remain seated and uh, he didn't have enough votes to get the endorsement, but he blocked Fishbach from getting the endorsement and it ended in a in a vote for no endorsement. Yeah, I mean, I can't really speak competently into any of that because it all depends upon the letter of the rules at each uh, step step along the way. And the one thing that has become very clear to me as I've continued to follow this story with the Ottertail County situation is that um, if you if you're only getting a partial picture of what the the question is that's being presented at any given stage, um, you are treading on dangerous water or treading on thin ice trying to to analyze it and speculate as to who was right or who was wrong. What I will say is that when we talk about the grassroots process, this is what it looks like. It's sloppy. Um, and I'm sure we're going to get into talking about what happened at CD6, where your interpretation of what the rules mean and say as an individual ultimately has to be subordinated to what the body decides. Um, and so the, for better or worse, the motions that were brought, and I don't know specifically what they were because I was only at CD7 long enough to speak on behalf of the House Republican Caucus, and then I had to leave to head over to um, CD4 in uh, Roseville to ha- hang out at that convention on behalf of the Frederick Douglass Foundation. Um, but these motions get brought. They get considered by the body. The body makes the decision, and then the body's interpretation of the rules is what ultimately stands, and that's the way the process is supposed to work. Yeah, and that's you know, first of all, in CD seven, one of the things that that made this a disaster was that Fishbach has employees who are the CD seven chair and was the chair of Ottertail County, and uh, we've seen a lot of times where the chair of the conventions or the chair of the county, the chair of the congressional district can manipulate the rules. Um, They have authority to appoint certain people uh, to positions to oversee different committees for arranging the the convention and such. And so there was a lot of uh, behind the scenes meddling 
of, of that. In fact, the 2022 delegates from Outer Tail County, they had an allotment of 35. And then because of the, uh, the extra votes they got next uh, year, they were allowed to have 37 delegates. So they had the 2022 delegates seated. They had two vacancies and the alternates on the list were, were Steve Boyd supporters. And so Fishbox team made a motion to prevent those from being seated. I mean, every, at every single angle, they tried to prevent uh, Steve Boyd from being a candidate. In fact, they tried to even say because Steve Boyd hadn't submitted some letter saying that he intended to run for Congress, that they weren't even going to let him be nominated that day. That was a, that was a, an attempt to try to get him completely off the ballot at all, which, I mean, goes against everything in the grassroots. You, anybody should be able to run for Congress. You shouldn't have to be able to, you know, raise a, a million dollars. All you need is gas for your car to drive around the district, meet with delegates, and you should be able to run for the, for the endorsement. If we get rid of the endorsement process, like a lot of people are talking about, then you go straight to a primary and for a congressional district or a U.S. Senate district, it it's a it costs a fortune to get out there to to run a primary campaign, and so it really comes down to which candidate can buy the seat, which candidate can have the super PACs come in or the major donors come in to buy the dis buy the seat. So it's a, I think it's really important to have anybody that wants to run for Congress to be able to run, and uh, even you know people like Emmer Emmer had a challenger this year. Emmer is in the safe seat. I mean he's it's a super conservative district, and he's got probably five to ten million dollars that he can throw at anybody coming at him. He's not losing a primary. But uh, if somebody wants to challenge him, a it's probably good for us because it gets him to vote more conservatively. He's probably the kind of the worst record in Minnesota for a Republican. Uh, you know, he's not being conservative at all, and so a challenger would probably straighten out his record, just like Fishbox record changed a lot since Steve Boyd announced he was going to run against her, but. There was a lot of shenanigans that went down in CD7 that I was just there to observe. And uh, but, it, but at the very first vote, when they were trying to seat the, the, the 2024 delegates, I saw Fishbach people, I mean, just, just patriots across the district voting to, to seat them. So the delegation, which sets the rules and could control that, they had the momentum to seat the delegates. But then the party came in and said, if you do this, we're going to invalidate the entire convention. I don't think they had the authority to do that. Uh, because the delegates voting should be able to set the rules for their convention. Yeah, again, I will say, like, taking your description of what happened for granted, I'll qualify it that way, right? Because I, it seems rather extraordinary to me that the state party would say that they're going to invalidate the results of a convention because they don't like what the will of the body determined or decided about how they wanted their will to be expressed um that if that's what happened that's pretty alarming and i'd be interested in hearing the other side of the story as to what the the process was there but generally speaking i mean the the idea the people who should be determining what the rules of their convention are um, including the credentialing process, that should all be, uh, unless it's dictated by bylaws or, or some other um, higher tier of parliamentary authority, it should be determined by the body. What they decide they want to do is what should go. I mean, that's the whole purpose of the convention is to express the collective will uh, of the delegates who are elected to it. And so uh, hopefully, I don't know, it's it does sound like a big mess. And I think we could probably, when we address CD6, which I was actually at, and I was a delegate there, and I participated in the entire process, maybe some of the things that apply to CD7, we can flesh out in more detail. Yeah. Well, um, let's jump into CD2 quick. So that convention was run by the books. Uh, the chair doesn't work for uh, any candidate or congressperson. Uh, it was chaired by Joe Ditto. And uh, they came in, had one ballot, and Taylor Rahm won with like 76% or something on the first ballot and uh, just crushed Joe Tara, who uh, Joe was was endorsed by Tom Emmer and a bunch of congressmen and had like $125,000 or $150,000 in PAC donations that came yeah. from other committees. Um, so he was, he was you know, out in D.C. mopping up money and uh, it didn't buy him the endorsement. And... Uh, so now we have the, the state party behind Taylor Rahm, or supposed to be behind him, and the NRCC is going to be behind Joe Tarab. 
And of course, the state party doesn't have any money, but uh, but Taylor Rahm does have the endorsement. And so uh, I, I've long said that CD2, because it's already a maybe 48 percent Republican district, it is a tough uphill battle to win. Having a having a primary in that district is assuredly going to lose the district in November. I can't see them coming out. Uh, whoever wins the primary, that person has no chance of winning the the general election when they've beat each other up for the next three months. It's certainly not an ideal situation. And the I, I think kind of the underlying issue there is that you've got two different standards of quality that are being applied. So on the Taylor Rahm side, the convention delegate endorsement side, you have folks who are looking at this, it would seem, from what I can tell from afar, uh, primarily through the lens of ideology. And they're looking at, you know, what you talk about, which is who's the most conservative, who's going to express our principles in the way that we find most satisfactory. And then on the other side, the forces that are behind TARAB are using a, a more conventional uh, kind of a money ball approach of, well, how do we win this swing district and secure and expand the majority in the United States House of Representatives? And they're looking at it from, from more, of more of like a business proposition of, you know, how do, what's a smart investment? And we don't think this Ron guy is a smart investment. We think this Tay Reb guy on paper looks better. And so we're going to invest in him. And the problem with the conflict between those two perspectives is that nobody is ever going to yield on either side. You, you're never going to get, and I'm speaking in broad generalities, but I think this is true. You're never going to get the people who believe that Taylor Rahm should be the guy and that, and, and the, the, let me reframe it like this. So both sides make the same claim upon the other side. So as from the party's perspective, the party has endorsed its candidates, Taylor Rahm. And so the argument that we make as a party is all you guys who are tossing money behind Tayreb, you should be tossing that money behind our guy because he's the endorsed guy. He's our candidate. And then on the flip side, the folks who are throwing the money behind Tayreb because they believe that he's the money ball player who could actually potentially sw flip the district from blue to red are saying, no, you guys are wrong. You're not looking at all the angles. And so you should be supporting our guy. And because you didn't, we're going to take you to a primary. And so it's it's this, uh, what do they call that? A insurmountable, there's a particular word that I'm thinking of that I can't can't come to mind. But it's an impasse, right, where neither side is going to give. And so the ultimate re, re, uh, outcome of that is exactly as you described, that it leads us down a path where these two trains are coming at each other and it's just going to be a train wreck and we're probably going to end up losing the district as a result. And I don't know what the, the ultimate answer to that is because in, in, in both cases, you're dealing with people's sincerely held belief that they are doing the best thing in order to prevail uh, in the broader contest that we're having over what our public policy ought to be. Um, you're dealing with matters of conscience. And so unless you can convince people to get off of their position that they're locked into, it's kind of inevitable what's coming. Yeah. Well, it's unfortunate that uh, that they're still proceeding with a primary in that district, because uh, I think we we did have a chance of, of flipping that district. And, and now I, I just I don't see it happening. Um, all right. So CD6, Tom Emmer's been in there uh, for quite some time. And uh, I mean, his his votes this last couple of years have been have been awful. Uh, and I know he's in leadership. So there's this idea that you have to, you know, continue to push forward with all the omnibus bills and the continuing resolutions. And uh, he's been a big advocate of funding Ukraine um, and, uh, you know, sending all this money overseas. But he had somebody that that uh, filed paperwork to run or uh, sat through the nomination committee to to become a candidate. And something happened at the convention where they removed him from the ballot. So uh, tell me what happened. Well, th that's not an accurate summation of the situation. So he was never on the ballot, which in, in this context, what that would mean is he was never nominated as a candidate. Um, he went through the nominations committee process from what was presented by the members of that committee at the convention. He was not very cooperative with that nominations process. 
as an example, uh, he refused to meet via Zoom, where you can actually, as we are now, see each other. Uh, and of course, this guy's a complete outsider in the truest sense of the term, meaning nobody knew who he was. Nobody had any association or knowledge of this guy whatsoever. And so all he would do is talk to them on the phone. Well, on the phone, you can't even know with certainty who it is you're even talking to. And it was just a really weird way to go about engaging with the nominations process. And so for that and various other reasons, I mean, you say he filed paperwork that's in question. I mean, he didn't have an FEC filing. He didn't have a campaign website. I don't believe he had signs at the convention, even as I recall. I could be wrong about that. But this guy, apparently, I never heard of him before, and I'm not exactly unplugged when it comes to politics. Uh, several people who were delegates at the convention, and again, you know, these are people, these are BPOU people, these are people who've come up through the process, whether they're new or have been around for a long time. Nobody had heard of this guy before, except for apparently the nominations committee. Um, I wasn't walking into the convention expecting there to be uh, a challenge to Tom Member because I hadn't heard anything about it. Yeah. Um, and so he's come in uh, for all intents and purposes off the street and expecting to you know take up 15 minutes of the delegates time and present his case uh, to re- secure an endorsement. And that endorsement has value. I'm, I think that there's I mean, you talk about. Um, you'd said earlier in relation to CD7 that anybody should be able to run for Congress. And I agree, anybody should be able to run for Congress if they are qualified under the law. But then you have to actually run, right? Like running means you do the work, you file, you put up a website, you raise money, you talk to people, you go to BPOUs, you introduce yourself, you call the delegates. Like I never got a delegate call from this guy. Um, So he did none of the work and he shows up the day of Saturday morning and says, I want to be nominated uh, as a candidate to uh, secure the um, GOP endorsement. And so the motions, there were three motions that came at various times throughout the process that would have had the effect of completely nullifying the nominations committee process. The first one, as I recall, was they wanted to insert into the rules, there was some sentence along the lines of um, candidates deemed to be qualified by the nominations committee are therefore nominated or something to that effect. And what they wanted to do, as I recall, was insert in the words qualified or unqualified into that sentence, meaning, you know, the nominations committee does its work. They determine this candidate's qualified. They determine this candidate's unqualified, but they're both nominated, which it's like, well, then what are we doing here? Like, what was the whole point of having a nominations committee process? And so that was argued back and forth fairly. You had three people on each side at least get up and take their 90 seconds to argue why we should change the rules in this manner, why we shouldn't. And ultimately, the body voted, and it was overwhelming that they did not want to make that change, and they wanted to maintain the nominations committee process. And so the second motion gets brought forward, and the second motion was to change the rules to strike the language saying that nominations shall not be allowed from the floor. Now, this is the point at which I got up in during the debate, and I made the case, look, guys, th- in effect, this change to the rules is exactly the same as the question we just considered. What you're, what you're doing with by striking this language is affecting through other means the, the same goal of the previous question, which is to invalidate the nominations committee process. We just saw how this body feels about that. This is a waste of time. We should vote it down quickly and move forward with our business. And that's exactly what happened. And then there was a third question that was brought or, or motion that was brought um, when the nominations committee report was offered to amend the report to have this guy, Chris Corey was his name. Um, be nominated. And again, it's like, you're, this is the third time we're going to do this. For the third time, you're putting forward a question that has the effect of nullifying the nominations committee process. It's like, at this point, we've debated this question so thoroughly that it's very clear that the the will of the body is to abide by the nominations committee process. And different members of the nominations committee had gotten up during the course of debate on these motions and shared their rationale for why they had deemed Corey to be unqualified um, and why they had deemed Emmer to be qualified. So all that information is out there on the table for people to consider. And so once again, 
third motion goes down. And it was at that point um, that a gentleman who I recognized as not being a delegate and therefore not having privileges to be on the floor and certainly not having speaking privileges under the rules, um, got up and started shouting about how this convention is corrupt. You're all corrupt. This is Biden-esque. You're all like Joe Biden. And then he and Chris Corey stormed out of the room and, um, you know, or chased out by the sergeants at arms, depending on your perspective. And uh, we moved on with our business and Tom Emmer ended up being endorsed by acclamation. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would say, and I know, I know two people that are interested in running or were interested in, in challenging Tom Emmer and CD six um, because they're so upset with his votes and because they believe that his, his votes um, nowhere near match what his speeches met, right? He comes in and gives these barnstormer speeches. He's a great politician, but his votes don't match the conservatism of his speeches in the district. And so, you know, in the end, I think what they really want is an option to not endorse, right? To, to, it's, you can be the you can be the Republican candidate for Congress in the district, but if you're not acting like a Republican, you don't deserve to be endorsed by the Republican Party. There's a and and and, and Tom Emmer needs to know that twenty twenty five maybe thirty percent of the delegates don't believe that he deserves to get endorsed. It doesn't align with the platform of the party, and uh, I mean. People are really upset. And so to have someone at least just run to be on the ballot would show that because, you know, one of the problems in CD6 is that Bobby Benson, who works for Emmer and gets paid, you know, 80 or $100,000 a year uh, to be his district director or 150 or whatever it is, um, he's also the chair of the party. The same thing that happened in CD7 and now in CD1 in my district where the congressperson hires the state party chair to work for them and pays them a huge mm-hmm. salary. So now the state party chair or the district party chair um, has this incentive to, to prevent an endorsement or to put their thumb on the scale and every option they can to prevent someone from being uh, the, you know, on the ballot to even you know go through the embarrassment of having 30% of the delegates vote against Emmer. Um, Emmer wasn't going to lose the primary um, and I doubt he would even lose the endorsement, but trying to shut out the option for someone to run, it just looks bad and it gets people upset. Like like what we saw in Ottertail County where the grassroots want to actually have a voice, however quiet or minority voice that is, when they get quashed, then they come back and it just starts to fester and uh, it isn't it isn't an open and welcoming process for people. And so I wasn't there, didn't see what happened in the rules, but um, it was disappointing to see that happened like what happened in CD7, some more shenanigans in a district. And, and I just would go back and say, we have to stop uh, employees of candidates uh, working in party leadership because it, 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 if, if anything, at least has the appearance of being corrupt. But I've seen it and I've seen it play out where it actually is corrupt. And we need to change that. So I, I kind of wish I was sitting here taking notes as you were talking, because you've made many points that are worth responding to. The the first thing that I think needs to be said is that the, I don't see any correlation at all between the question of Ottertail County and CD7 and what delegates should be seated at the convention and the motions that were brought in CD6 and the contention over whether or not Chris Corey ought to have been nominated as a candidate uh, to consider the party's endorsement. In the case of CD6, and again, I can speak to, to it authoritatively because I was there as a delegate. I watched the process. I participated in the process. What happened at CD6 was 100% in order. It was a properly, uh, I, <laughs> again, I'm getting stuck on the word, presided over. It was a properly presided convention process, grassroots process, like we say we want, right? Like we we want the delegates to be elected from their caucuses and to come to their BPOUs and then in turn get elected to be delegates to the Congressional District Convention. And then once they get there, they have the opportunity to review draft rules and to consider reports from nominations committees and then vote up or down on those processes. And that opportunity was provided. It was properly presided over according to the rules. Nothing was out of order. And the convention well, but let's, exactly as it should have. But what about the nominations committee? I've seen this happen too, where they say, well, that person's not qualified. Is I mean, does it say in the rules that they have to meet over Zoom? Or does it just say they have to meet with the nominations committee? And, and I don't I, I don't believe that it's I don't believe that it says 
Well, I, I won't speak to that because I don't know. Um, but what I will say is that the nominations committee uh, process is, first of all, standard operating procedure. I've never seen a convention take place anywhere within the Republican Party where there isn't a nominations committee process. I went through one as a candidate. You've gone through one, I'm sure, as a candidate. Um, every other representative or elected official in the Minnesota GOP that I'm aware of has gone through a nominations committee process at some point in their tenure. It's usually a relatively sleepy affair. I mean, the bar that we're asking people to to step over is not particularly high. Demonstrate basic competence, like have demonstrate that you're not going to just face plant as a candidate before we give you our party endorsement. That's the standard. It's not very high. Like act like somebody who knows what they're doing at to a minimal degree. This guy could not meet that standard. Well, and that's what I'm, that's what I'm asking, because I mean, what I, what I heard was that they, they asked him about his fundraising and he said, you know, when I, if I get the endorsement, I'll be able to fundraise, but I, you know, right. Right, it's, it's right, pretty right. tough to fundraise when you're running against Tom Emmer. And so that, that, that was one of the reasons why he was, he was not qualified because he doesn't have the fundraising and because he didn't meet on Zoom, which doesn't seem like it would be in any role. So I've been at a few conventions where a candidate was found not qualified and it's very rare and it speaks volumes to the delegates to say, well, we don't know this guy and he was deemed non-qualified. So let's not even let him on the ballot. And I believe that that, influence like you know bobby benson's influence on that committee probably had some weight to say let's just you know let him run but we're going to say he's not qualified so all the delegates would be like wow let's not even let him get a vote i i don't know what influence if any bobby benson personally had on the nominations committee well Um, i mean tom emmer and every every elected republican including you in that room uh works with tom emmer and mm-hmm. and and not accusing you of anything, but mm-hmm. anything that people can do to just save Tom Emmer the embarrassment of having thirty percent of the delegates vote against him is gonna is gonna you know gain favor with him. And so you have this Tom Emmer's influence on that delegation, whether directly through Bobby or other people uh, in the in the committee. I just I I wouldn't see that as being a fair convention if he were to announce you know six weeks ago and had campaign signs and actually tried to mount a campaign. I think you'd you'd see the the same pressure against him to just unfold his whole candidacy uh, to prevent him from getting on the ballot at the convention. So th- th- that's an interesting idea because I hear variations of this idea tossed around quite a bit that certain people should shouldn't be part of the process at whatever level. Now I'll grant you that. Uh, I don't think it's a particularly good look for campaign staffers or office staffers who are getting a paycheck um, from an incumbent to be in leadership roles in party units. I don't think it's a good look. I don't think it's probably a best practice. It's not forbidden by any rules. And that's something that future conventions, future meetings of the state central committee, which there's one coming up, um, can consider such questions. But kind of the overriding principle, like, Zooming out from that particular example of Bobby Benson or the C7 staffer for Fishbach um, chairing things up there to just this general idea, because it's been suggested with like legislators and their spouses or or people who are legislative staffers or, you know, people who work in different capacities in campaigns. All these people should be forbidden from being delegates and from having anything to say with how the party is run or whether or not the party engages in its endorsement. Who's left? Like yeah. you're, what you're what you're talking about there is the people who are most invested in and most committed to this process, and the party's endorsement is something that should be treated with enough respect that we put it we we have some basic minimal level of expectation for the people that are seeking it. I don't think that's at all unreasonable. Um, the idea that as a party. We're just we're going to consider endorsing somebody who nobody in the room knows who just walked in off the street, I think, is patently absurd. And especially when you compare it and contrast it to the other races that we've talked about today. So CD7, Steve Boyd, I heard of Steve Boyd. I'm not in his district. I heard of him because he was actually campaigning. He was doing it the right way. He was getting in front of delegates. He was getting his name out there. He's making his case. Um, Same thing with Taylor Rahm. I see Taylor Rom everywhere I go. That I don't know that there's anybody working harder than Taylor Rom. Um, he's doing the work and he earned his endorsement. 
uh, up in CD7, you had the no endorsement for Fishbach, despite all of the consternation over who ought to have been sitting in that room. You, you, they were able to prevail in getting the no endorsement with Fishbach, which was the goal, right? And so th those cases demonstrate that if you can develop campaigns and candidates that have a basic level of political competence, then you can achieve, you can score your wins of sending the signal to the incumbents that they're not doing the right thing. And what I would argue is that's the only way to do it. Like the, if, if you want your protest against what Tom Emmer is doing to be effective, then it must be competent. If you, if your attempt, there's a, a certain saying that's bouncing around in my head. And I can't quite think of it. Like if you if you try to kill the king, you better succeed or something along those lines. Like if you're actually going to put in an attempt to send this kind of a message and you do it so incompetently and so feebly that you can't make it through like basic hurdles that should be easily overcome by just doing normal campaign work, like calling delegates and introducing yourself. If you can't do that, then it actually becomes counterproductive. The, the anti emmer forces in CD6 lost credibility that Saturday as a result of doing it the way that they did. That doesn't help with the conservative cause. That's not going to motivate Tom Emmer to vote better. If you had done the, if you had done it competently, if you had recruited somebody who had some merit um, and who was going to put in the work and was going to raise some amount of money at all and deploy it to try to put pressure on Emmer, and then you had a non-endorsement at a convention, then you might have seen a change in behavior in Emmer. But as it stands, he's got no reason to to watch his step now at all, and that's the fault of the people who are making this feeble effort to try to oppose him instead of taking it seriously enough to put in the work. Well, you know, when, when, when person called me for advice on uh, if they should challenge Emmer for the endorsement, I mean, it, it would be interesting to see, in my opinion, I think that it would, it would help the cause because it would cause them to vote more conservative if they actually ran a campaign, but they went through all the list of people that would privately support them, but would not, publicly support yeah. them. They wouldn't sign the list. You know, when you're running against a powerful incumbent like Tom Emmer, how do you get, I don't know what the requirement is in CD6, but you have to get so many delegates signing a sheet nominating form so that, you know, pledging their support for you in the first ballot. Every one of those people would have a target on their back, especially if they were sitting legislators uh, from Tom Emmer. And so it, 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 it takes a lot to run against a sitting incumbent. Probably the best way to test this out to see all the process work would be to choose someone who nobody knows about and who doesn't have a political career right now because that person's going to, you know, if this if this guy that ran, this Chris guy, decides he wants to run for state rep in Andover or whatever, um, he's not going to have a shot because Emmer's people are going to go back for payback and, you know, demolish him. So uh, I'm just saying that the that the process to run should be simple. And, you know, they could have just gave the guy the vote. He would have he went down on the first ballot. Maybe he got 25 percent, maybe 20 percent of the delegates. Uh, you know, if it was by uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, anonymous ballot, you know, sealed ballot versus a standing or something where nobody's going to stand for somebody against Emmer. But uh, it was it was sad to see. Let, let's jump into uh, the state state parties having a state convention next week and a state central committee meeting, which you mentioned. Um, I don't think the only person there's going to be an RNC committee man and woman elected at the, uh, at the state central committee. Um, there's only a few people running for those positions. And at the state convention, uh, really the, the main business is just electing RNC delegates to the national convention, uh, a couple of electors, statewide electors. And if Trump should win, that would be uh, casting their vote for president and uh, there will be a U.S. Senate endorsement, and we have, you know, two people running for U.S. Senate. One guy I've not seen. I think he came to CD7, but I didn't catch his speech. Um, and then Royce White is running. Uh, I think he's from Minneapolis or Hopkins or something. Um, but that's it. There's not a lot of business. But then we had this Lincoln Reagan dinner that was announced on Friday, and uh, out of the blue, President Trump has, was announced as the keynote speaker. So he's coming to speak in Minneapolis or in St. Paul at the Lincoln Reagan dinner. Um, so I, I got a ticket and uh, we'll see what he has to say. Yeah. Um, I, 
unfortunately, I and my legislative colleagues are likely to be tied down by the Democrats until midnight um, on that day. And the Democrats know Trump is coming to town. They know it's a big event for us. And so naturally, they're going to manage the calendar in such a way as to ensure that we have as little opportunity as possible, um, if any, to get away and potentially spend any time um, listening to the former and potentially next president of the United States, Donald Trump. I, I remember when uh, we had organized a major protest in front of uh, Governor Walz's mansion on April, it was right around tax day in 2020 when he locked the state down and instituted all these orders. And so uh, they wanted to keep everybody uh, in session on the floor or Zoom or whatever it was. And uh, I ran over to to the protest in front of his mansion and uh, I think they called me out on the floor. But yeah, they, they try to do things to mess with you when they're in control. Um, the I think it'll be an interesting convention. I'm manning the uh, Republican Liberty Caucus booth there, and uh, you know I don't I don't expect many shenanigans. I don't think I've heard any rumblings from the grassroots about trying to uh, throw Han out again or some Otter Tail County stuff. But uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, it's always interesting to see what uh, motions are made from the floor. Um, but let's get into the legislative stuff that you've done. So last week there were long nights. Uh, dealing with gun bills, the Safe Storage Act, which I should probably hide that. Um, the Safe Storage Act went into, or is, it passed the House, it might pass the Senate, and that bill requires you to lock up your firearms in your house. Um, otherwise, you're going to be charged with a, was it a gross misdemeanor? For the first offense, and then it escalates to a felony and uh, subsequent offenses. Yeah. I mean, don't be dumb when you have little kids, keep your guns locked up. But uh, for the people that need them quickly, at, you know, most, I live out in the country and uh, you know, in fact, just last week, my wife screaming, cause there's, you know, some uh, varmint in the backyard that I had to run out and shoot quick. And if my gun, actually my gun wasn't, it wasn't the safe. And it took me a couple of minutes to get my, my gun out to run out and, and shoot it. Uh, if you live in Minneapolis, you got people banging on your front door or sneaking in your front door. Or if you live in Detroit Lakes and some state senator tries to sneak into your house, uh, <laughs> your your firearms are locked up. So here we got the state senator, Democrat state senator busting into houses at four o'clock in the morning. And then Democrats are saying you don't have the right to be armed anymore or have quick access to your firearm. Uh, you guys tried a gazillion different amendments and they were all shot down. Yeah, well, and you accurately described the situation, right? And it's it, it really is mind-numbing and mind-boggling that in the context of Senator Mitchell burglarizing her own mother, we're moving forward with this bill in the immediate aftermath, by the way, like the first opportunity that they had to set a legislative calendar for the day, they countered this bill that would make it harder to defend yourself in precisely that circumstance. I mean, Mitchell was tripped over by her mother in her own bedroom. Like, that's how close she was. And we've now since heard in the media reporting from KT, KSTP uh, that Carol Mitchell, the name of the stepmother, um, that she believed that Mitchell was there to do her physical harm. So that's the exact situation where you need the ability to defend yourself quickly. Now, what the Democrats would argue, and they did argue on the House floor, is, well, our bill allows for you to have a gun loaded if it's within your direct control, in other words, holstered on you um, or in your hand, or if it's within arm's reach. So this, this whole scenario you guys are painting of, you know, you can't sleep with a firearm in your nightstand, that's not true because it's within arm's reach. Well, what if Mary Moriarty is the one who's doing the measuring of an arm length, right? Like, and you, you said something else that I think is really worth pointing out. You said, don't be stupid. Keep your, your guns locked away from your kids. That is a somewhat colloquial paraphrase of what current law is. Current law 609666 is the negligent firearm storage provision that's already in state law. And it says that you, a, a person who negligently leaves out a loaded firearm where a child can or reasonably should have been expected to gain access to it is guilty of, a, a, I believe it's a, a gross misdemeanor. And so case closed, right? Like, and I even said this on the House floor. I'm like, we can just table this nonsense right now and move on to taxes or something. Like, what are we doing? This is ridiculous. 
Um, and it's, it's another example, just like with the SRO legislation. So you go back and you look at the school resource officer issue. What Democrats did there is they interposed themselves between lawful actors, in this case, law enforcement officers, school resource officers, between lawful actors and the reasonable use of force standard. And they said, you know what, even though there may be a scenario where using certain techniques um, in order to restrain somebody might be deemed reasonable after the fact in a court of law, we're going to take those tools off the table just preemptively because we don't like them. They, they make our tummies hurt. And so we're going to say you can't do it, even though if it was adjudicated in a court of law after the fact, you would be found to have engaged in reasonable use of force. Now, that created such a disruption. It was so destructive to public safety in our schools that you had jurisdictions around the state representing a broad ideological spectrum. It wasn't all conservatives and Republicans. You had Hennepin County Sheriff Dewana Witt, uh, who pulled her school resource officers from Hennepin County. They did that because they recognized that you, you, you can't do this. You can't tell a law enforcement officer that they can't engage in reasonable uses of force in order to affect their lawful duties. And so ultimately, that was so apparent that the Democrats had to come back this year and work ever so reluctantly with us on the other side of the aisle to fix what they broke, right? Um, and so we've already seen this play out. But now they obviously haven't learned their lesson because here we go again. And now it's arguably worse because it's not just limited to school resource officers, but it's everybody in the state of Minnesota. Now we're going to say that everybody in the state of Minnesota no longer gets the benefit of being able to defer to a reasonable standard and, and take their case before a judge and say, listen, here's how I live. I'm a dude who lives alone in the woods with no kids. So the way I store my gun is reasonable, even though it would not be reasonable if I was living in a cul-de-sac in St. Michael and ran a daycare, right? right? It's like circumstances matter. And what the Democrats are saying is no, circumstances don't matter. It's our way or the highway. And they're doing it in a vague and arbitrary manner. And I believe, and I think I have good reason to believe, that the ambiguity and the dysfunction of this law is 100% intentional and intended to affect people not having guns in the state of Minnesota. And the reason why I believe that is because public safety chair Kelly Moeller said so in committee. She said when our lead Paul Novotny criticized her for the number of gun control bills she's been hearing this year and said it takes spun that old yarn of it takes a good guy with a gun to stop a bad guy with a gun. She got triggered, pardon the pun. And she says, well, you know, we saw with President Ronald Reagan back in the day that he was surrounded by good guys with guns and he still got shot. We have a gun problem in Minnesota. That's what she said. We have a gun problem. So what that tells me is that your intention with all of these laws that you're considering, all these bills you're considering, is to go after the guns. Because she didn't say we have a crime problem in Minnesota. She didn't say we have a violence problem in Minnesota. She didn't say we have a prosecution problem and a law enforcement problem in Minnesota. She said we have a gun problem. That's what they're trying to affect. Well, wh one of the things that I do when, when reading legislation and determining if I want to vote on it is I, I ask myself a series of questions. And one of those is how will this, be, how will this law be enforced? Right. Sometimes bills are written. Well, they're really well intentioned. The Democrats who who like to tout gun deaths or gun violence numbers um, ignore the fact that seventy six percent or some like I think it's seventy six percent of gun deaths are suicides. Right. Um, and so they were talking about how this bill will prevent suicides. Like all of a sudden, if you don't you don't just so like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to kill myself and I'm going to do it now. But if it, I have to wait three minutes to get my gun on my safe, I'm not going to like that isn't that isn't going to prevent suicide. Someone that has access to their own guns, um, but that they they like to. But I heard that on the House floor, one of the Democrats talking about how it would prevent suicide because they wouldn't have immediate access to firearms. Um, and it's just wrong. Uh, but but how do you suspect that this bill is going to be enforced? This law is going to be enforced. Are cops going to knock on your door and say, Walter, I want to see, show me all your guns. Because first of all, they don't know who has guns and who doesn't. They don't know how many you have. 
But how are they going to enforce this law? Is it only after the fact that uh, that you killed you killed yourself, and now they're going to charge you with uh, a gross misdemeanor? I mean, I think that they would argue that there is not going to be proactive front end enforcement of this, where you're like you as you suggest going door to door, knocking on doors, asking to see people's guns and where they store them and how they're being stored. Um, but certainly after the, the fact, the idea is, you know, if there's a if there's a suicide or if there is a crime committed and the gun used in that act is determined to have been sourced from someone, they're, they're, they're going to start they're going to have cause. They're going to have reason under this law to start asking all sorts of questions about, well, where was that gun at? Was it properly locked up? Um, and, and try to go after the person who owns the gun, because ultimately that's what they're trying to affect with all of this is to target gun owners and to make it legally hazardous to be a gun owner in hopes that you will not be a gun owner. And that was pretty strongly implied on the house floor by representative her during the debate where she was being questioned um, about uh, this, uh, this might have been another bill that we were questioning her about, um, where we're talking about the, um, oh God, I forget exactly what the provision was, but it has these escalating um, penalties for repeat offenses. And she said something to the effect of, well, maybe if you can't figure out how to manage your weapons, you should you should reconsider being a gun owner. Maybe that's what you should do is just reconsider whether or not you're going to own guns. And that's exactly what they want you to do. They want you to reconsider whether or not it's wise for you to be a gun owner in the state of Minnesota. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about the other bill that passed. Well, first of all, is it is this a uh, safe storage bill? Is this the only uh, part of that bill? Or was there also uh, something about um, straw purchasers? That was a separate bill. It traveled separately. The straw purchaser uh, penalty increase, which of course was appropriated from a bill that Peggy Scott had introduced back in 2019 and had been around for years and they could have passed it any time, but they chose to do it this way, um, was in a Representative Berg bill and they had tacked on this provision. And, you know, we use the, we use the shorthand of binary trigger. But that's not actually the language in the bill. The language in the bill has to do with a uh, a gun which fires, which discharges around on the um, squeeze of and then release of a trigger. And that was the center of quite a bit of debate in committee and on the House floor, because why don't you just say binary trigger? Like, why are you being so vague? And um, there was more than it wasn't just Republicans elected in the House of Representatives. It was industry groups, manufacturers, uh, law enforcement organizations that were looking at that language and saying, you know, it sounds an awful lot like you're trying to ban Glocks, which are one of the most prolific uh, firearms used in the law enforcement community. Uh, and that ambiguity remains. And the Democrats say, no, trust us. We're we're not doing what it looks like we're doing. Yeah, we we, we trust them. Um, so, so that bill, so the, the binary trigger ban passed and that was merged with the, uh, straw purchaser felony bill. Yeah. It was a poison pill that was introduced into the, uh, straw purchaser penalty increase because that legislation had broad, almost unanimous, I'm sure bipartisan support. So naturally what the Democrats did, what they're all they're good for, which is to take something that everybody agrees with and figure out a way to make it partisan. They're awesome at that. Yeah. Now, now you guys, so you voted against the straw purchaser bill. Is that right? The modified straw purchaser bill that contained a completely irrelevant and poorly written uh, language about binary triggers. Yes. Um, you know, the, the, that's another bill that I'm, I'm concerned about on how, how they're going to enforce it. Um, and it's, I mean, first of all, raising it to the issue of felony, felony is so much more than a gross misdemeanor because it also brings with it a, a complete ban for life on owning firearms. And so I'm always concerned about when you make things a felony, you, you know, you stop a lot of like federal subsidies for housing and it prevent people from getting jobs and ban their right to own a firearm for the rest of their life. And it's a very serious crime. The 
how you prove a straw purchaser is you have to prove intent. Like you have to show not just that they bought a gun for someone, but that they knew that that person was not qualified. Um, in so many instances, it's very difficult to prove. It's like proving voter fraud uh, that you have to prove that that person intentionally voted when they knew they shouldn't have. Um, it's very difficult to do. Although there are some cases where it seems to be obvious where they're buying like a hundred guns for people. But, uh, but a lot of times, I mean, my wife, I think bought a gun for me. Um, I was qualified to own a gun, but you know, where she, I said, Hey, you know, all right, I went to go buy one and it didn't have my license with me or something. And so she bought one. Uh, and, and now we're going to have retailers policing that, uh, where they have to, cause there was also a push to have the retailers be part of that, uh, you know, whether it's a civil lawsuit or a criminal where they have to start policing who they sell guns to, who may be suspicious of straw purchasing. And uh, it puts a lot of onus on the, on the retailer to try to police that too. But uh, I, it's, I don't know how this is going to be. I, I don't know if there's going to be a lot more prosecutions, but there was some complaints that, that they're not prosecuting straw purchasers because the crime was too low. Um, Correct. That's what, that's what attorneys in, let I say attorneys plural. It's Hennepin and Ramsey County, the usual suspects. That's what they were saying is that the reason why we're not prosecuting these straw purchaser cases against people who are obviously engaged in reckless criminal conduct um, is because, well, you know, the pen, it's it's hard to prove, as you say, and it's uh, the the penalty is so low that it's not really worth our time um, to take this up. And so the objective of the Scott bill was to increase the penalty in order to make it worth their time, right? Uh, the one change that the Democrats made when they appropriated that bill from Representative Scott and gave it to Representative Berg, who, by the way, is from Burnsville, so it's all political, right? You know, we're going to take this and give it to one of our representatives from a community that just had a tragedy involving straw purchases and firearms used against police officers. There's nothing political about it, though. Um the one change that they did make that was a good change that I agreed with is that in addition to saying that you have to know um, that you are selling or providing a gun to a prohibited person, they added the language or reasonably should have known. And so that opens it up a little bit to where you're saying uh, you, you, you can't hide under this. Well, I, how was I to know that my boyfriend is a criminal? But, you know, like we're, we're not going to play games. Um, and I think that's the way it ought to be. Um, if we're if we're going to prohibit people like felons from uh, having f access to firearms, then it damn well better be enforced. Yeah, or or somebody that uh, has a uh, has a uh, medical marijuana card or whatever, um, also a prohibited person. Um, you know, there's a long list of people that are prohibited from owning a firearm. And yeah, I, if if Hennepin County and Ramsey County weren't prosecuting them. Uh, and maybe they will now. Uh, I imagine there's going to be a lot of rural counties that will also be prosecuting those. So I'll, I'll be curious to watch how many felonies are handed out uh, based on this new law. But you, do you think both of these are going to pass the Senate? Or I've heard some rumor that the safe storage won't pass the Senate. I don't know what to think after yesterday. The, this ethics committee hearing that the Senate had on Senator Mitchell, where they once again punted uh, now they're punting till after the legislative session to deal with this situation. It makes me very suspicious of what their intentions are to try to push through in these last few days here, this last week of session. The conventional wisdom and the scuttlebutt has been that they don't have, even with Mitchell, that they don't have the 34 votes that they would need. Um, and again, it's a 34-33 split in the Senate to pass these radical gun provisions. But, you know, fool me once, shame on me, you know, Lucy and the football, I've seen this game so many times where we, we rest on the seeming comfort provided by somebody like Grant Housechild, for instance, saying that they won't vote for an egregious provision and then their arm gets twisted in a back room and they turn around and betray their constituents and go back on their word. Yeah. Well, you brought up Senator Mitchell Mitchell. So let's let's end this uh, the podcast with discussing her her fate. Um, I watched uh, I watched it at, kind of after the fact. We were like an hour late in watching it. My wife and I streamed it on TV and uh, watched Senator Lucero do uh, just a bang up job. He's your senator. Um, you know, a friend of mine, uh, he did a really good job of uh, of making the complaint. And Senator Housley did, too. 
And the Senator Mitchell didn't say a word, but her attorneys were there. And this crazy looking like uh, there's a lot of stuff on Twitter making it look like he came off a Saturday Night Live, this like bad die job uh, attorney. But he made it into this big like legal argument. And this this ethics case is about ethical behavior. It's not about legal behavior. You don't have to commit a crime to, to face an ethics charge. It's that are you bringing are you attracting bad repu- are you creating a bad reputation for the Minnesota Senate based on your behavior or what you're doing in the media in in you know it's it could be freedom of speech but what you're saying and doing is ethically wrong um, and and he just made it all into this thing about due process for court and uh, it, you know claim the Fifth Amendment or use the Fifth Amendment to to have her not answer questions. Um, so I, I actually, before we jump into that, I get response, we got to talk about Glenn because there was uh, an ethics charge from EMQ and Aaron May Quaid, who was the ethics charge that uh, brought down Tony Cornish, my predecessor. Um, and uh, so she's very familiar with that process. She filed a, a charge against Glenn last year uh, for him sending out an email uh, ahead of a vote on transgender stuff, basically showing people what transgender mutilation of children looks like by se- sending a video from the University of uh, Indiana or Kentucky or something about transgender uh, surgeries. And it was a link to a Google results. It wasn't actually like a video. It was just basically saying, please go out and educate yourself. And by the way, this is a pretty graphic uh, video, so beware. And uh, she filed a charge that made it look like he was distributing child porn. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. She reduced him so again to be very clear what he did was he sent as you know you can send send to all basically all senators all representatives um an email that said here is a link to a google search so you in order to get to the actual video you got to click twice you got to know what you're doing and be trying to do it and warning this is graphic and what it was was a medical training video so we're not talking about, you know, smut here. We're not talking about porn. We're talking about a medical training video used by medical professionals to demonstrate gender reassignment surgery performed on juveniles, which, as it turns out, is precisely what Aaron May Quaid's bill, the Trans Refugee Bill, HF146, that was authored by Representative Lee Finke and passed and signed into law last year in 2023. Exactly what that bill was about, exactly what that bill enabled. And so Grunhagen's point here was, look at what we're doing. Face the reality of what you are enabling with this heinous piece of legislation. He provided them with legislative research relevant to a bill that they were actively considering. And Erin May Quaid is so dishonest and despicable that she goes out and reduces that in an ethics complaint to video of children's genitalia. She reduces all of that context down to video of, ch- of children's genitalia and then goes out in the media and on Twitter and anybody who will listen to her talking about how Glenn Grunhagen is distributing videos of children's genitalia um it and just like kind of from the start when when you have to so blatantly mischaracterize what it is that even happened as part of your ethics complaint it's a pretty good indication that it's frivolous and meritless another good indication that it was frivolous and meritless is that the senate didn't do anything about it this was filed over a year ago it sat on a shelf collecting dust the Democrats didn't want to do anything about it. And then all of a sudden, you know, oh, magically, Senator Mitchell gets arrested for a felony burglary of her own mother. And now it's really urgent that we bring forward this complaint against Senator Grudhagen that's been collecting dust on the shelf for a year. And this was actually brought up during the course of the hearing yesterday of, oh, isn't it convenient that, you know, suddenly we it's so important that we talk about this now um, subsequent to the uh, arrest and ethics complaint filed against Senator Mitchell. And they quite absurdly tried to make the argument that the reason why they didn't uh, pursue this complaint against Grunhagen earlier is because, well, we had scheduling difficulties. And they used examples like, well, you know, some people on certain nights, they have like, you know, sports games for their kids or they might have. It's just really hard for us to all coordinate our schedules. Are you kidding me? You are senators. 
coordinating, coordinate your schedules. Like what you're telling me, this is what that says. By making that argument, you are confessing that it wasn't that important to you. It wasn't that big of a deal to you personally for you to put in the effort to coordinate your schedule to do your goddamn job, right? That's what they said yesterday. Um, and so they move forward with, with this frivolous and ridiculous complaint against Glenn Grunhagen. And during the course of that proceeding, they engage in, in such bad faith and just dig in and are really invasive in their questioning and their approach to Glenn. But then when we shift over to complaint number two, Senator Mitchell, who again was arrested and charged with the felony burglary of her own mother, and there's all sorts of corroborating public information out there to substantiate that this did happen, she did do this. Suddenly the tone changes, and suddenly they're, they're, the premise that they offer is, well, folks, we, we have no idea what happened. We can't say that we know for a fact that she snuck into the basement window and crawled into her mother's bedroom and was tripped over and was found with all sorts of stolen property and a flashlight and a sock so she could reduce the light and dressed in dark clothes at 4.30. We don't know that any of that happened. Yeah, by the way, Bobby Joe Champion, he, champ he chaired the ethics committee yesterday. There were two characters who he channeled really well. One was... I'm trying to think of the lawyer from the O.J. Simpson case. You know who I'm talking about. Johnny Cochran. Johnny Cochran. He channeled his inner Johnny Cochran in, in hilarious and deeply mockable ways that, again, you can go on Twitter and see all the examples, such as, for instance, trying to argue that it, it might have been the one-armed man, um, almost quite literally. So he, he cited the fact that in the 911 transcript, when Carol... Mitchell, the stepmother, the victim in this case, called 911. She initially described the intruder as he and kept referring to the intruder as he because obviously she doesn't know who it is at that time. Certainly she wasn't expecting that it was going to be her own stepdaughter who was victimizing her at that moment. Um, and so he actually tried to argue that, well, she said it was a he and Senator Mitchell's a female. So clearly must have been somebody else. I mean, the level of absurdity that went on in this ethics com committee hearing was unfathomable. And the other character who he and the lawyers for Senator Mitchell really loved to channel, and this is continuing to happen today on Twitter, you got folks like uh, Abu Amara who are making this case, is they're channeling their inner Morpheus. Can you really believe the reality that you're presented with? Is any of this real at all? Can you trust your senses in any way? Who are we to know what's up and down and left and right? Like, I, I don't know anything. Do you know anything? I haven't been told anything. Like, and, and the premise that they're offering is that we can't have a finding of fact in the context of a Senate ethics committee hearing until the criminal case against Senator Mitchell has been fully prosecuted. And that's their, the, the basis of their entire defense. It's really an incredibly weak defense on multiple fronts. But the, the premise, which is a prima facie absurd, is that we're somehow going to conflate and properly should conflate a criminal proceeding with a Senate ethics hearing. The two things have nothing whatsoever to do with one another. The Senate is a self-governing legislative body that has the right to make findings of fact relevant to whether or not one of its own members engaged in conduct that does not uphold the highest standards of ethical conduct. And if, and if that process, this, this is where I'll land it, if engaging in that process presents some sort of threat to the criminal defense of Senator Mitchell, she has an option. And that option is to retire which is exactly what she should have done to begin with. It is not the burden of the Minnesota State Senate to halt or hold back or delay or work with kid gloves their business in order to carry the burden of Senator Mitchell's criminal defense. That is not the Senate's problem. That is her problem. It is on her to worry about her criminal defense. It's the business of the Senate to take care of the Senate and to uphold its integrity, and to uphold its rules. And that's what they should have done yesterday. And, of course, because they're controlled by Democrats, 
they didn't. Yeah. Well, I think that Senator Dan Schoen, who uh, who at the same time of Tony Cornish, um, you know, got caught doing bad things. They both resigned because they didn't want to bring bad attention to the Senate or the House. And, uh, and, you know, think Al Franken, for instance, you know, he wasn't facing criminal charges. He was just, you know, it was a bad photo or whatever. And he resigned from the U.S. Senate uh, over this is this is actually a criminal charge. You know, Glenn, I just back up to Glenn. I feel so sorry for him because he does he does so much in reaching out to the other side to try to educate them on issues, um, whether it's global warming or whatever. Uh, and a lot of I know it falls on deaf ears, but um, unfortunately, the, as a result of what happened with Glenn, people are now not going to share information with the other side. You're going to have more polarization because of what EMQ did. In fact, when I came in the legislature, which is right after Tony Cornish was forced out, um, I mean, they took me aside and said, Jeremy, do not talk to any Democrats. Do not get in an elevator with EMQ. Don't talk to anybody with a hyphenated name. Just stay the hell away from them. Because there was this concern that they were just going to go after any any guy that that looked at somebody or said anything to anybody. That was during the whole Me Too movement. But, you know, Glenn, if you go out and Google his name, the first thing that comes up is Minnesota Ethics Panel defers on action on Senator charged with burglary. Like, he's tied to that. You have to you have to read the article to figure out it's not Glenn, you know. I mean, and then of course the 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 child genitalia stuff that'll live on Twitter and in you know the Google search results forever, um, and it's it's just ridiculous what they did what they did to him, um, and it's unfortunate. But um, you know, no action will, will happen to give people a, a per perspective of what's going on on the inside because people have asked me like, are they going to throw her out of the Senate? I said, look, the the ethics committee, and we should have said this at the beginning of this conversation, you got two Republicans and two Democrats. And in order to take action, you have to have a majority. So the idea is it's not up to the Republicans. It's up to one of the two Democrats, Bobby Joe Champion and uh, uh, Katiza Watutin, or what's her name? The the other senator that's there. Kunish. Kunish. Uh, Kunish, yeah. Um, they're not going to, they, they, they will fall in line with their caucus. They're there to, you know, yeah. and then of course, when you talk about, there being a one seat majority in the Senate, that means basically neutering their ability to lead and legislate and govern by getting rid of her. They're not going to do it. Well, I, so I would amend that just a little bit. It does not thwart their ability to lead, legislate and govern at all. What it would do is it would restore the integrity of the state Senate and they would still have the capacity to lead, legislate and govern in a bipartisan manner. Yes. They would actually have to acknowledge the tens of thousands of people who are represented by Republicans, the millions of people, actually, that are represented by Republicans in this state and actually work with them to determine what the best policy is in bipartisan fashion for the remaining handful of days in the Senate. But because they're too arrogant and entitled and childish to take that responsible action, they are not leading and they are not truly legislating. That they are engaged in a farce. And this this is such a black mark on not just the Minnesota State Senate, but the legislature as a whole. Because, listen, my Democratic colleagues in the House, they're pretty crickets on this. They're not coming up stay, saying anything, making any case about uh, that this process is in any way a sham. And they should be. Like, we should all care about the integrity of these institutions. And the fact of the matter is they don't, as evidenced by their actions. And they are each of them in turn looking at what Senator Mitchell did. And yes, she did it. I, I can't put her in prison for it because that requires a proof beyond a reasonable doubt. But my determination, me using my eyes and my basic cognitive function to look at the facts as they're presented and make a determination in my own mind, in the context of my own judgment, and then in engaging in my own legislative sphere, I can say she did what she did and that I know she did it because she got caught red handed. I can say that. That's OK. And so can you. And so can every Democrat. And instead, what they're saying is. Don't believe your lying eyes, and we care more about our own power, even for just a few days worth of it. We care more about that than we do about upholding the integrity um, of these institutions, and it's absolutely abhorrent. And these people need to be voted out of office, and I believe after the ridiculous performance that we saw this week in the Senate um, Ethics Committee, you're going to see a lot fewer people voting Democrat than have in the past.
Well, I, I hope so. I hope their memory isn't so short. Um, you know, one of the reasons why they brought forward the Glenn Grunhagen complaint and, and scheduled it before uh, Senator Mitchell is because Republicans had arranged to have, you know, hundreds of people there protesting and shouting in the lobby when it was supposed to start at 1 p.m. And then they delayed it. They voted to delay the hearing until hours later. And then they had Glenn up first and that took hours and so her her uh, hearing didn't even start until in the evening and went late into the evening. And that was by design to just try to, you know, quash the uh, public's dissent. And, you know, it's it's disgusting behavior. I, I, I'm not shocked by it happening. And of course, they voted to uh, basically do nothing for a while and run out the clock. The the uh, implications, of course, are if she resigns during session, there's a a special election that would be uh, done outside of the November ballot. And if she resigns, you know, a month after session, then the special election gets put on the November ballot where Democrats have a, a severe advantage. And, you know, that's that they're going to maintain their majority. That's how, that's how they do it. Yep. 100%. They All right. are shameless. No doubt about it. Yeah. Well, uh, Walter, when, when is session over for you guys? Well, it's supposed to be over on May 20th, which would be a week from this coming Monday. And of course, no legislative actual bills can be considered um, on that day uh, under the constitutional requirements. So the actual last day for legislating will be next Friday, which is the same day that Donald Trump is going to be in town. Oh, actually, no, it'll go through Sunday. You can, you can go through Sunday, right? Well, if they had the legislative days to work with, but they don't. Oh, because they're out of yeah. Okay, you can only be in session so many days. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Right. So they'll they'll keep you till midnight. Uh, hang the cloak over the top of the clock so you can't see that it's past midnight while they cram through legislation. And mm-hmm. uh, okay, so uh, good luck next week. I'm sure you're going to be held there in the late in the evenings, most most nights, passing a bunch of bills and uh, or watching bills be passed without your votes. Uh, yeah. As usually happens when when they're running the majority, and uh, hopefully this DFL trifecta will be ended in November. Of course, uh, if the Democrats want to, they can call special sessions back and, and legislate all summer long, um, and uh, they they have that option. The governor calls a special session, and they can continue doing that, especially if they feel like their DFL trifecta is going to be taken away from them in November. Right. All right. Well, uh, thank you, everybody, for listening to another episode of the Omnibus Podcast, where all subjects are germane. Pocket pocket version here. Thousand page Omnibus (laughs) bills that, that nobody knows what's in it.